Exodus chapter 32, we'll begin reading in verse 1. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 1. The Bible says, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation." And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought, hast brought out forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Now tonight we are taking a break, the next couple of weeks taking a break from our series uh, through the Gospel of Matthew. And we're going to focus on the subject of revival as we have revival meetings coming up in two weeks and uh, really want to take these couple of weeks to prepare uh, with messages our heart prepare our hearts uh, for uh, revival uh, both as individuals and and church and and we have uh, the Kellogg's and and the people of Faith Baptist are uh, they they uh, often uh, participate and we're thankful to have them participate in the revival meetings as well so we have a couple more than one church represented here tonight but uh, we saw them, we're seeing them sooner than expected, by the way, since the <laughs> golds are sick, so they didn't have their uh, regular services today, but, um, but we're glad they're here anyway. Um, but they were planning to be here for revival meetings, and, uh, and so they're, they're usually here um, uh, faithfully for that, uh, at least during the weeknights. And, uh, but, uh, so our church here, and then any church that's represented uh, here during revival meetings, we want to have prepared hearts, and we want God to do a work in individual lives. We want God to do a work in churches, and, uh, uh, and, and that there would be revival in the churches. Uh, and so tonight, uh, the message is a revival of prayer. Revival of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for this very, uh, very interesting interaction between Moses and you. Uh, and Lord, I pray that we would learn from it, that we would take these things and apply them and, and apply them to our prayer lives. And Lord, uh, we thank you for your mighty hand, your power, and your justice, and your goodness, and your mercy. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, uh, speak to hearts tonight in the way that you desire. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So, this morning, uh, we looked at the choice between rebellion and revival, which was illustrated by the lives of Saul and David. And as a matter of fact, Psalm 51 was our uh, primary text for this morning. At least we started, with, we started and finished it with this morning. And then uh, in between there was uh, the account of Saul and his rebellion against God. And then David, the account of David and what led to him writing Psalm 51. And tonight, we're going to focus on the importance of prayer for revival, the importance of prayer for revival. 
Uh, having revival in our lives requires a work of God, and it is prayer that prompts God to action. And you're going to see this here. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of examples tonight of prayer in, in relation to revival. Uh, now, this passage that we just read didn't have to do with revival per se, but what it is showing us some patterns in prayer, showing us some things that should be part of our prayer lives uh, and that can uh, be a, uh, a help in us in a help for us in praying for, for revival. We should be praying for ourselves and for our church uh, here that uh, we would be revived and that the Lord would do a work in our hearts uh, during revival meetings. Uh, but we also should be praying for the preacher that God would lead him to preach the things that uh, will be exactly what is needed for those who are in attendance uh, for each of those services. And so first of all here tonight, Moses shows us the greatest motivation in prayer. Now there are, there are various reasons why we pray, uh, but have you ever thought about why, why you're asking God to do what you are wanting Him to do? Now, it's one thing to ask him for things, but you think about why you're asking him, why you're taking certain needs before him, why uh, you are asking him to do this or not do this. Well, to, tonight we see here in Exodus 32, Moses' why. He, he v speaks very clearly about the why. Because a lot of times, um, you know, if you're asking for healing for somebody who's sick or has a disease or illness, I mean, you, ju you just want them to be healed. You just want them to feel better. You want them to not deal with that anymore. Uh, if you're asking for something regarding finances, uh, some provision that is needed, uh, one of the, um, you know, it's just you're asking. Many times we ask because, hey, we just want to see the need met. That's oftentimes. Or if it's somebody you're, you're praying for spiritually, you're, uh, you're asking, why are you asking for, for that? Because, well, we, we want them to get right with God because it's a good thing if they get right with God or if they get saved. T Moses took it to a, a, another level here that it just goes even deeper. Now, those are good reasons for prayer. Nothing wrong. God wants us to take our cares to Him and He wants to, wants to hear from us. Uh, but Moses shows us something else here as to why he asked God to do or, in this case, not do a certain thing. And... Uh, goes even farther that I would venture to say, and I'm not going to make an assumption that it's representative of everybody here uh, in, in the service tonight, but I would venture to say that many times when we pray, these are not the reasons why, we, why we're praying for something. And But we'll see. Now, getting a little background here, which we read the entire text all the way down to verse 14, the reason... That what led to this prayer, this, this, and we don't, you say, well, was Moses praying? Well, yes, he was praying because he was, he was asking God. He was talking with God. He was asking him. And um, so it was, it was in a lot of ways more of a conversation, but what is prayer? It's, it's our talking to God. It's our talking to God. Asking him for things and seeking his will, seeking his face. Well, what was that? Well, God, uh, uh, God was giving Moses the Ten Commandments, giving him the law up there in the mountain, and during that time, and it took, took Moses a while, so during that time the people demanded of Aaron, they said, make us gods, which they'll go before us. Because we don't know what happened to this Moses, and so they end up doing that, and, and then they uh, eat and drink, rose up to play, so there's immorality going on, there's uh, partying going on, hey, let's have a nice feast, let's have a good time, hey, now we've got these new gods uh, that we're going to give credit to. And so God said to Moses, uh, get thee down. So people have corrupted themselves. And he's uh, describing to Moses, telling him what is happening. And notice in verse 9, And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them. Now, that's, that's one of the only times I can think of God telling somebody, let me alone. <laughs> you know, it's not something you see every day, uh, God saying, but he's telling Moses, now let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation. He's saying, look, Moses, they are so wicked. They, are, they have so corrupted themselves. Just let me wipe them out. Don't get in my way. Let me alone. Let me do what is in my mind to do. 
And, uh, and he said, I'll start over with you. I'll start over with you. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak? So first thing he does is he, he appeals to God's deliverance of the people from Egypt. He says, you've brought this people out with, a, with great power and with a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? So he's saying, look, that, this, is going to be, uh, this is going to give you a bad name. That, that God couldn't take care of his people. He brought them out, but then they get into trouble and he just wipes them out anyway. That's going to give God a bad name in the eyes of the Egyptians. Oh, you know, yep, they trusted in their God to bring them out of Egypt, and they got out of Egypt, but then they perished in the wilderness. He, con they, he consumed them from the face of the earth. He was going to wipe them out as a people. And so notice the boldness of what Moses says here. Now, here's the thing. Moses had just spent these days getting the law, having this really close encounter with the Lord. And evidently, I mean, he was, uh, he, he saw the need, uh, he, he felt free to be bold. <laughs> Even after all of that, he's got the Ten Commandments, he's got the law, he's, he's um, and he, he boldly says, turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Wow. Wow. Remember, then he says in verse 13, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and sayest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And so he's saying, look, you made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel, and uh, you made a promise to them, that the seed we multiplied is the stars of heaven, that the land, I'm going to give you this land, and it's going to be inherited forever by that people. So look, you've made a promise that if, if you wipe them out, you're not going to be keeping that promise. So he then appeals to God's honesty, his trustworthiness, appeals to God's promises that he made, and says, look, God, you made this promise, so I want you to please remember this, Lord. And reminding God of what he said is a powerful part of prayer because God doesn't lie and he always keeps his promises. So that's a powerful thing. So these are some of the most powerful motivations in prayer. Appealing to God's name, that his name is at stake. Look, you, your name is at stake because the, the wicked, the pagan wicked nations, they will look and they will see what you've done to your people and, uh, and they will have reason to... Uh, look down upon you, not look uh, favorably on you. They will have reason to mock. They'll have reason to question, well, why did it, did it happen this way? Why did their God just do this to them? And so God's glory would be at stake. And then his promises, God would then break his promise. Now, God didn't, I don't believe God had any intention of breaking his promises. God doesn't break his promises. But he was, but this, this illustrates just how wicked and how displeased that God was with the people. And, and perhaps it was some of this, him saying that was maybe also a test to Moses to see Moses' response that we now have recorded for us, which is very powerful. Because God is having this in his mind. And the fact is, uh, God, uh, God's ways are past finding now in the sense that he can do whatever he wants. If we, he decides in his justice, his judgment, his wisdom to do things a certain way, uh, he, it's certainly his prerogative, but, but Moses appeals to those things that are a part of God's character, his trustworthiness and his, his making and keeping promises. But may, maybe we should have more of, and I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to assume, I'm just, uh, I, I'm not going to assume this is true for everybody, but I would just 
have in my mind that if I had to lean a certain way that the majority of Christians praying uh, aren't thinking about praying and, uh, and going and boldly saying to God, God, your name is at stake, so we're asking you to come through in a mighty way here in this situation. There are certain, there, and there are certain times where God's name is more at stake than others. If it's something personal that you're praying about and maybe a sickness or something, you know. But if, if let's say, you know, there's a work of God that you're trying to do and, 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 and you're facing opposition and, and maybe the world is mocking, the world is opposing, the world is, is looking for a reason to uh, 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 scorn Christians and, and the Lord... You know, that's a good time to be praying, God, saying, God, would you please do something because your name is at stake here. Your name is being dragged through the mud or your name is potentially going to be dragged through the mud. You know, there are times, I mean, because I'll be honest with you, that, that may, that's, more tr that's very true in a lot of ways because there's just been a, an increasingly bad testimony in, in, within Christianity in America that has given the world a, a, a reason to look down on Christianity, to scorn, to mock. I used this illustration this morning because it fit with the morning message, but I'll, I'll give it again tonight. So if you're in here this morning, you hear it again. But for those of you who weren't, you'll hear it for the first time. There was a, uh, a congresswoman from South Carolina. She was at a, a prayer breakfast. She attended a prayer breakfast uh, the other day. And uh, Tim Scott, who's a South Carolina senator, he's running for president, and they had a prayer breakfast there in South Carolina. And uh, so she gets up, and she, this was, uh, somebody recorded this on video, and she gets up, and she's saying some introductory remarks about being at this prayer breakfast, and, and she says, you know, I had to leave at whatever time it was, 7.40 or whatever, uh, get picked up to take, be taken to the prayer breakfast, and she said, I woke up at 7 o'clock this morning, and and uh, my fiance there is there in bed, and he's wrapping his arms around my wrist, uh, my waist. He's wrapping his arms around my waist, and she says, "Oh no, not not now, not now. I got to go to the prayer breakfast." And so she said, "So she is, um, she says, oh oh, a little TMI there." And she goes on and is, is uh, saying this, and saying about how she just wouldn't miss this prayer breakfast, how she was early for this prayer breakfast, and how important it was, and yet she is making a joke and light about their living with her fiancé and committing fornication. She says, oh, oh yeah, he can wait. Well, I'll see him tonight, she says. Now, what a mockery to Christianity that is. What a mockery of the Lord that is. A mockery of, of morality, biblical morality that is. And at a prayer breakfast. And so then later on, she probably got a lot of flack for that. And so she then posted something on social media that... It says, she said, um, she said, I go to church because I'm a sinner, not a saint. <laughs> I thought, well, no, what is that supposed to mean? I mean, what are, what are you, what are you uh, talking about anyway? And then she said a few more things and said, I guess my pastor and I will have a lot to talk about. And then she puts this smiley laughing emoji after that, like she's just laughing it off. And this is somebody who's at a prayer breakfast, politician at a prayer breakfast, so what, what does the world think when they see nonsense like that? You know, it just, it does not give them any reason whatsoever to want to get to know the God who is supposedly represented at these prayer breakfasts. I'm not 100% I'm not sure it is the same God represented at the prayer breakfast, but, uh, but they're claiming it. In the world's eyes, they don't see a distinction. They see these people claim to be Christians, and so they aren't seeing any distinction like we would see a distinction. And so in that regard, God's name is at stake. And so maybe there's some things to pray about, maybe regarding our, our political leaders, maybe regarding some politics, maybe regarding some of those things nationally that are happening, or, and saying, look, God, would you please do something? Your name is at stake here. Your name is at stake. That should be our motivation. I mean, it's, 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 it's grievous enough to us as individuals when that kind of thing goes on. But... but taking it up the next level of praying with the motivation and the heart and just telling God, look, God, your name is at stake. Would you please do something about this mess? <laughs> that is, that's a powerful motivation for prayer. It really is. Because God's name is at stake in a lot of cases, a lot of situations where you might need an answer, 
so that God could get glory and it could be a testimony to somebody else. Or, uh, so appealing to God's name, his glory, and then also reminding, of him, uh, reminding him of his promises. And you could be praying for somebody to be saved and you can just remind God. And when we say remind God, we're not saying that God forgets. We're just saying we are speaking it back to him. In a, in a sense, in, in a way as if we were reminding him, but of course he doesn't forget, but he wants to hear it from us. And that if somebody needs to be saved, we're praying for uh, somebody to get saved and, you know, God, your word says uh, that it's your will that all come to repentance. And so we're just asking you to please grant this person repentance that you would do a work in their heart that they would be saved. You're, you said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So would you please bring conviction to this person's heart that they would believe on Jesus Christ and call upon you to be saved. That's a powerful way to pray when you are praying Scripture back to God in reminding Him of what He has already said. Because God's name is at stake. There are so many, so many things. God's testimonies. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a saved person who's not living right. Maybe they need to get right with the Lord. And you're saying, God, would you please, uh, for your namesake, for your glory... Uh, do a work in this person's heart so then they could go on and live to bring you glory. Because right now, you're, they're not a good testimony for you, even though they claim your name, they claim to be saved, they claim Jesus Christ, but they're not a good testimony for you. Would you please, based on your, for your glory's sake and for your name's sake, would you please intervene and work in this situation? So here, um, as Moses reminded God of his promises. He says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants. And so in verse 14, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Now when we see evil here, it's not talking about sin. It's just talking about bad things coming upon them. That God would bring judgment upon them. His wrath would be uh, uh, poured out upon them. Uh, so the Lord repented of the evil. So don't get, don't get nervous about God repenting. <laughs> Uh, what it simply is, it's a change of mind. It's not repentance most of the time in the Bible does have to do with sin. But in this case, it's God changing his mind from what he had told Moses he was looking to do. And so it says God repented, the Lord repented of the evil, so he did not bring that severe judgment upon them. But there were consequences. There were consequences. When Moses went down and uh, and he, he threw the tables uh, down, the, the, the stones, the tablets there. Uh, and Joshua thought there's a noise of war in the camp. And Moses said, nope, nope, it, it's not that. Um, they're singing, they're having a good time. And so he threw the tables out of his hands and right onto the golden calf. And, 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 on, and on it goes. And this was really the story of, of the the journey from Egypt to the Promised Land that was repeated uh, multiple times in the nation of Israel where there were very severe consequences that came upon them for their disobedience uh, and their rebellion against God. But God, the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. And so Moses shows us that great motivation. And yeah, you know, we should keep that in mind. Not just what we pray for, but why are we praying for it? Why are we praying for it? It can be very powerful when we, when we add that, we implement that in our prayer lives. Secondly, we see in the book of Habakkuk, turn back to Habakkuk. Interesting uh, little book of the Bible, Habakkuk, one of the prophets. That is after Nahum, just so you have a point of reference. Oh, you don't, don't know where Nahum is? Then it's after Micah and Nahum. Habakkuk uh, and Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So close to the back of the Old Testament. But Habakkuk shows us that understanding comes through prayer, which then leads to rejoicing. Now, turn to chapter, look at chapter 1 and verse 
2, actually we'll, we'll start reading at verse 1. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and will thou wilt not save. Uh, he complains, uh, actually let me keep reading here, uh, verse 3. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that rise, raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. And so what he's doing is he's complaining about the wicked condition of the nation of Judah. And then God later answers that he's going to use the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, to bring judgment upon Judah. Habakkuk responds in verse 12, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. And, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue, when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? And makest men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. Uh, so in verse 13, he's saying, look, you're, you're, pure, you're pure eyes than to behold evil. He's, he's, he's recognizing the holiness of God, and he's saying, you're going to use this wicked nation to bring judgment upon the people of Judah that are, in his, in his words, were not as wicked. They were more righteous. He's, he's questioning that. Why would you even use a more wicked nation to judge Judah? But then uh, God responds in chapter 2 that uh, they will, uh, that he will destroy them, that Babylon will not stand in its pride. Now look at verse 1. He says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that read it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. But the just shall live by his faith. And so God reassures him that God's plan is going to uh, be fulfilled, be accomplished. But then he gives this contrast here uh, with a great principle about faith. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. So there's the wrong, there's that prideful heart, that prideful attitude, which was um, uh, a, a definite um, characteristic of Babylon. But it says, but the just shall live by his faith. And that's just shall live by faith is repeated in the New Testament. And so there's a great principle of the difference between the righteous and the wicked. And the wicked are those of pride, and the just are those who live by faith. And then... Um, so, so God, in a large part of uh, chapter um, 2, he's, he's describing that there will be uh, a judgment that comes upon him. And, uh, and then down in chapter 3, Habakkuk writes a song of praise, which includes a prayer in chapter, I'm um, sorry, in verse 2, uh, in verse, uh, verse 1. So this is after God answers Habakkuk. He then, we see kind of it shifting here, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon uh, Shigilonoth. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, notice this, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known in wrath remember Mercy, And so God's telling him, look, this is going to happen. He's going to use a wicked nation to accomplish his purposes in the nation of Judah. But then Habakkuk comes back to a reassurance because of what God had said. He's reassured that God will work everything out. Even with the impending judgment, he would rejoice in the Lord and find strength in him. And he asked God to revive his work in the midst of the years which is his work in the nation of Israel, or the nation of Judah specifically in this case. Uh, but very specifically, 
God did revive his work in the midst of the years for the nation of Judah. He brought them out of captivity. He did take them back to the land. And God has also been working in the nation of Israel's history, the people of Israel, for years since then. And he continues to revive his work and the nation of Israel still exists. That people still exist and there will be a great revival uh, during those very last days and uh, God's going to keep his word. He, what he says is going to come to pass will come to pass. I love that. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known in wrath, remember mercy. Saying in the midst of your wrath being poured out, Remember mercy. So he's appealing to God's character of being a merciful God. And then he goes on. Um, uh, let's keep reading here. Uh, God came from uh, Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise and his brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand and there was the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth, he beheld, and drove asunder the nations, and ever, the everlasting mountains were scattered, the perpetual hills did bow, and his ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan and in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was the Lord displeased against the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea, that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah, thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in her habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, even for salvation with thine anointed, thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the next Selah. Thou didst strike through with his staves the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was as to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great waters. When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them. With his troops. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. And notice verse 19 The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. And so just as a deer is safe in a high place, so would he be in a place of safety even with this judgment that was impending, the wrath of God, the, the ch chastisement of God that was coming upon his people. And there's also a prophetic aspect of that as well to uh, the very last days when God brings judgment upon uh, the what's described Babylon in uh, Revelation. Uh, that there will be safety for his people in that day as well. He's going to keep his people safe. And so he's saying, I, the Lord is my strength. He said, yeah, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And so no matter the hard times that may come as a result of this wicked world system that God will judge, that he will destroy someday, we can trust in God's justice. And in the midst of hard times, as a result of apostasy, just as the nation of Judah was just backsliding away from the Lord, and we live in a time of tremendous apostasy, we can lean on God's mercy and we can rejoice in the safety God gives to the just who live by faith. There are things that we face, things that come upon us that we get caught up in just the goings-on of the world but God has a special hand. He has a special eye on those who are the just, who are living by faith. And he had great reason to rejoice. Great reason to rejoice. And so as we pray for revival, uh, one of the most... Uh, let me back up a minute and say something else. The, here, here's the thing. No matter what happens to America, no matter what happens to America, we can rejoice 
we can have joy in our hearts. We can live with the assurance of who our God is. We can, we should be the, ju the just ones, the righteous ones, walk by faith. The just shall live by faith, just shall live by his faith. And so no matter what happens, there's, there's all kinds of things going on and you don't know how all of it's going to shake out and all of it's settling and the squeeze keeps getting put on people. And, and I mean, I, I heard yesterday that uh, Con Edison and the, the big utility around New York City that covers New York City and that surrounding area, just to, to transition their electric grid, they're going to be jacking up their electric rates like by 14% or something or 9% or whatever it is. And uh, I mean, there's people that are already paying out the ears and it's like, who, who knows how all of this, where all of this will lead. And people are squeezed, and that's just economically speaking, let alone the spiritual condition. That's really the main concern, the main issue is the spiritual condition of the nation, which is in a very bad place. And so all of this that can cause to, uh, f there, there can be fear. Um, you know, we, one of our, I didn't tell, even tell my wife this, but the uh, assistant, I don't know, Brian Pettit's the assistant. He's assistant there, or song leader. Or, he, was, he, was assist, he was assistant pastor at the church we were in in Michigan. And, and uh, he posted a picture of this broken down fence on Facebook. Uh, you saw that? Yeah. So he posted this picture of a broken down fence on Facebook and basically that apparently these young people had come by and just, just broken down the fence in their yard. And apparently it wasn't the first time either. And basically from what he said, said basically they, they'll call the police and the police just don't do anything about it. And that's, those types of things are happening more and more where the police either are unable or unwilling or maybe don't have the manpower uh, to, uh, to um, uh, you know, deal with those types of incidents, these little things that happen here and there. Because what happens is when the wicked, when the mischief, when the evil spread so much, the little things here and there, it's hard for those who are meant to keep order and to enforce the laws. They can't be everywhere. It, it, the, the cohesion and the, the stability of a society is based on people actually doing what's right. Otherwise, you have a society that frays and comes apart. And he, he mentioned that, I don't know if this was exaggeration or if this was real, but he said they had nine police officers on duty and Lansing's like a city of, I don't know, 100 and something thousand, 120,000. They had nine police officers on duty. And I was like, that's not enough to, <laughs> that's not enough for Lansing, I tell you that. <laughs> when, we, when we moved, when we got married, we lived in an apartment in South Lansing, which is close to where the church is. And, and, um, and, and we joked around that apartment complex that, my wife would say, you know, that's the, uh, what did you say, like secondary headquarters of the police department or something like that because we're always seeing a police car there at another one of the buildings. And it's a rough, rougher area of, of town. I guess it's gotten a little rougher even since, since we've lived there. But, you know, people, it, there's, there's so many things happening where it can, cause, uh, it can cause fear, it can cause uncertainty, it can cause uh, to be shaken and, and, and but no matter what happens in the midst of the apostasy, in the midst of this world system, we can lean on God's mercy, His justice, His power, His strength, and rejoice in His help and safety that He gives to the just who live by faith. And uh, as we pray for revival, one of the most powerful things we can do is appeal to God's name. Appeal to God's name. God, your name is at stake. Would you bring, uh, would you bring glory to your name by working in this situation? Because that's what I want most. I want your glory. Would you get glory in this person's life? Would you get glory in that person's life? Would you get glory in this community? Would you get glory in this situation? And God, you, um, I, I don't want the wicked to have a reason to be able to mock your people and mock you. Would you show yourself strong on behalf of your people? God, you've made certain promises, and, and, and I just want to remind you of these promises, and I'm trusting and claiming these promises from your word. And that then leads us, just like Habakkuk, we can, as we pray, we can gain understanding. Because as Habakkuk prayed, as, as he would seek the Lord about these things, God would reveal more to him. Now, I'm not saying God's going to talk to you the same way he talked to Habakkuk. 
with an audible voice or, or in the same, same direct sense. But here's what God does do. If you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you and God can speak to you with that still small voice and give you uh, an indication of, you know what, I, I believe this is what the Lord is leading me and He can direct your thoughts. And as you pray, you're in a position where God will more direct your thoughts, directing your paths, and, and you have, a mind, have the mind of the Lord on the matter through the direction of the Holy Spirit in your life. And we gain understanding as we pray, as we seek the Lord. God, would you give me wisdom? Would you, you know, and, and maybe we bring things up to the Lord and say, look, God, this is the situation. You know, things maybe we don't even understand, but as we pray and we just have an open heart toward the Lord, God increases our understanding, which then leads us to rejoice because then we get back to the character of God, who He is, what He does, and that He does keep His promises. We have that reason to rejoice. And so as we go into um, these next couple of weeks, go through these next couple of weeks leading up to revival, let's have a revival of prayer. Let's prepare our own hearts to be able to receive whatever is going to be preached by the Word of God. Pray that uh, pray that they would re get here safely. Pray that they wouldn't have issues in coming here and uh, that they would have prepared hearts as well as, as well as us having prepared hearts. And then God can do a work as you are in a position then to receive the Word of God being preached. You're not having to play catch up when you're sitting here in the service and get your heart and mind prepared. But if you take time beforehand then you're in that position that you receive the Word of God being preached and God does a work in your life.